organized and we have we have organized till date uh, as one of the important activity uh, to commemorate the 75 years of independence of our great country uh, till date we have organized uh, 19 lectures and today is the 20th uh, lecture in this series uh, the lectures uh, which we have organized uh, they cover uh, various topics uh, on uh, research um, biotechnology you can see genomics uh, the environment uh, the motivational lecture uh, like the one we had by cc ravi shankar and then uh, many uh, lectures uh, on the frontier areas of research by uh, uh, many of our uh, colleagues who are working in uh, uh, foreign universities and in the list we have many more uh, experts and these lectures are being attended by uh, our vice chancellors by our directors by senior officers and also the students but we have two platforms uh, the key officers we allow on the zoom with the with the uh, video and there is another platform uh, 75 lecture series dot webcon events uh, dot com where uh, we give access to participate ten uh, thousand uh, about ten thousand uh, participants uh, friends uh, today's lecture is one of the lecture which is of great interest to each one of us because you see today everybody is facing in one form or another the covid nineteen. Uh, and we all know uh, what is what are the repercussions of this pandemic uh, covid 19 pandemic so actually what lies ahead a lot of questions are there in the mind of um, many of us i can say all of us and for that uh, we made a special request uh, to none other than uh, dr jc suri jagdish uh, suri sir uh, who is a well known uh, pulmonologist Uh, i can say one of the uh, greatest uh, pulmonologist in the country uh, i have already given in the in the poster which i have circulated uh, or in the uh, banner which i have circulated uh, about uh, dr suri he is uh, director and head of the department pulmonology critical care and sleep medicine at the fortis uh, ranjan thal hospital vasant kunj and one of the key responsibility which he is uh, having now is the uh, is the covid-19 private hospitals exclusively for uh, this covid-19 care is there but in addition to that the key responsibility which he has got is the national expert committee on covid-19 so he is the member of that committee which is under the ministry of health government of india uh, in academics also if you see he has lot of interest a lot of uh, contribution 23 uh, uh, dm thesis and more than 60 post graduate dissertations have been submitted under his guidance by the medical students and uh, he is the national advisor for the development guidelines of h1n1 influenza and flu vaccinations since 2009 uh, he has represented india at the who uh, for the development of international h1n1 guidelines in geneva he is the course director of ministry of health and uh, family welfare government of india and many more uh, he has uh, also developed the guidelines for the evaluation of amarnath yatra pilgrims very uh, important uh, guidelines uh, he has uh, received many awards uh, to name a few uh, i can just say he has uh, received uh, the Vishesh Chikitsa Ratan Award by Delhi Medical Association in the year 2012, and he has received the Lifetime Achievement Award for contribution to the development of sleep medicine in India for the year 2017 by American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, and many more. If I start talking about his contributions, I think uh, even one hour will be less. Uh, he is uh, the MD from uh, Delhi University. Uh, dnb from national board of examinations uh, dt uh, cd from uh, again uh, university of delhi uh, mbbs uh, from uh, university college of medical science university of delhi and he has uh, undergone the uh, trainings uh, at us uh, and many other countries 
and he has more than 100 publications in national and international journals of high repute and uh, delivered more than 500 uh, guest lectures. Um, I am greatly uh, impressed uh, with his uh, contributions and uh, I think we all are eagerly waiting uh, for his lecture. But uh, Dr. Sahib, I'll also take this opportunity in informing you as the doctors are the uh, COVID barriers, the agriculture scientists and the farmers are also not less than any uh, COVID barriers. The contribution of ICR today, you see the, the council, the Indian Council of Agriculture Research, uh, which has organized your lecture. They have contributed immensely in making the food gain production today is more than 300 million tons. And you see the egg production, you see the milk production, you see the pulse production, anything, we are, we are not importing anything. We are just self-sufficient. And this situation could have been from, uh, uh, could have been uh, worse if the food items were not sufficient in our country. If we were not food, food sufficient in any one of these, uh, other milk or, or whatever you see. So the contribution in green revolution, the contribution in white revolution, blue revolution, or any kind of uh, uh, this uh, rainbow revolution, you see the contribution of our farmers and ICR and our all uh, national agricultural research system is not uh, less than any other thing. So we uh, thought uh, we have a lot of uh, queries in our mind, uh, but before that, uh, we would like to uh, thank you for accepting our invitation and uh, agreeing to deliver this uh, lecture uh, for which we could not have uh, found any better person than you. So thank you, uh, Dr. Suri Saab, very much for uh, agreeing for this lecture. And I hand over uh, the floor to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Suri Saab. Is my screen visible? Uh, yes. Okay. Good afternoon. At the outset, I would like to thank Mr. R.C. Agarwal, DDG ICAR, for giving me this opportunity for this very nice invitation. I really feel very much privileged that today I am addressing the distinguished educationists of our country in the field of uh, agriculture research. When Mr. Agarwal asked me to deliver a lecture, I have been just thinking, you know, that what should I be speaking? So that whatever I speak should become relevant to the audience. He requested me to speak on COVID-19. We know we have been struggling for the last one and a half year we have seen a very challenging time of our lifetime dealing with this one of the greatest uh, calamities uh, what we have seen the the pandemic the covid-19 pandemic though i have been a part of smaller pandemics like flu in 2009 and also 2003 there was sars one at that time but this time it is it is actually been after one century you know before this, we had uh, the famous Spanish flu again in the same year, 1980. That was 1918. And this is again here, you know, uh, around 2019, uh, we had the another pandemic coming exactly after one century. Now, I thought I would be talking about something about COVID-19, the future, what lies ahead. We have gone through a very difficult time. Things are improving. They looks to be, at least they are improving. And uh, it's time that we gradually get back to our normal routine. It's time for the schools and colleges to open up. And I thought if I could discuss something on that area, 
probably uh, since this talk is going to go to vice chancellors of various universities, it's it's a time when everybody is thinking of opening of the colleges and school. So it's very important for us to understand what COVID-19 has been, what are the lessons we have learned from it? And on the basis of those lessons, what best we can do in the coming near future so that we are able to get back to our normal life as smoothly as possible without causing a further flare up in the, in the pandemic situation. So what I'm going to do today is we're well, going to talk about COVID-19 pandemic in India. What is the current scenario? Why did the second wave occur? It's very important. If you want to prevent the third wave, if at all, if it is there, because there is a lot of speculation about this thing, we must know the genesis of second wave, how the second wave came down and why uh, we are thinking that there is a possibility of third wave. And what are those factors which will determine whether there will be a third wave and what will be its severity? What is, will it be same as the second wave or it will be much less than that? Though, what are those factors? Although it will be very difficult to predict exactly the nature of the third wave if all it is there. And then we will be talking about what lies ahead. How can we prevent in that we'll talk about how can we prevent or at least mitigate the severity of third wave, then talk about some COVID-19 vaccination, the challenges and the possible solutions, and how we are going to safely reopen our businesses, schools, and colleges. First, we'll talk about the current pandemic situation in India. And you know that we are far from you know, ending the pandemic. We may we may say that maybe the beginning of the end has been made, but we are still far from it's over. You know, if you look into the number of cases per day or the total number of cases, we are number two. We are just behind United States uh, in terms of having the number of cases. And if you look into the deaths, then we are probably the third one after the after United States and India. So we are we are practically third in terms of the number of deaths. Uh, what are the top affected states in India? Though the number of cases have come down in the major states of India, but there are still some areas like uh, Kerala in South India, Northeast, and even Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, there is a slight, you can see from the last few days, there is an upward trend in the number of cases which are being recorded each day. So what does it mean that uh, we, we do have still about 40,000 cases per day? So, so that itself speaks that uh, we are, uh, the, 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 the epidemic is very much there and it is far from over. And if we don't take uh, proper measures, then probably it can again show another flare up in the form of third wave. Now we have, if, if you see that in the last uh, one and a half year, we have suffered two waves out of which the second wave was uh, much more devastating here. The first wave was in the last year, which is started somewhere around uh, May, June, around May, and it lasted till November. And during this wave, you can see that this is the peak number of cases. It was around one lakh per, per day cases, what we saw uh, during this period. And then this wave came down. The second wave started somewhere in March, 2021. It was a short, and very quickly rising. So it has a huge tally and toll in terms of uh, cases, this thing. And you can see that we, we saw 4 lakh cases per day in the second wave as against 1 lakh, which was four times per, uh, than the first wave. 
Now, what could be the basic difference between these two waves? You, we know that we have already taken a lot of measures before this uh, first wave started. There was a countrywide lockdown. Uh, there were uh, COVID uh, uh, appropriate behaviors uh, was uh, uh, properly observed. So the strict lockdown and these measures resulted into a into a lower uh, peak uh, in this first wave. In this, but then subsequently, uh, when the the first wave ended, and few surveys were conducted, you know the zero zero surveillance zero surveillance was conducted to know the level of infection in the community. It was presumed that about 50% of the population have antibodies. And to some extent, it was perceived that probably uh, we have developed herd immunity. And with the result, you know, the, the, the lockdown um, conditions were relaxed and uh, things suddenly opened up a bit too rapidly. And people also became a bit complacent. And the result, what you saw, you know, is in front of you. So here you can see that the, the, the second wave going so rapidly and so heavily that uh, it resulted into a lot of morbidity and mortality. This thing. Now, if you see in India, you know, after this second, this is the first wave, this is the second wave. Where are we now? We are somewhere at the end of July now. We are in early August. And you can see that the number of cases, at least in, in a major part of the country have gone down significantly. It was four lakhs per day here. Now it is almost 40,000. And out of this 40,000, I think 50%, about 20,000 we see from Kerala and uh, other uh, major chunk comes from Northeast and some other districts of Southern India. So uh, we are actually now about, uh, it is about uh, 50, 60, but there is a recent, again, you know, some increase, little increase in the trend. Now we have recorded 80 cases, 80, 85 cases in Delhi, and also in other parts of the country, there is a slight increase. Now, what is the meaning of this little increase? We'll have to keep a close watch on this and uh, know about it uh, more in the, in the near future. The question is, why did the second wave occur? And will there be a third wave? The, these are the two very important questions. As I mentioned to you, that after those zero sur surveillance um, data was available, uh, as it was realized that probably uh, we have developed uh, herd immunity and we have come to an end of the epidemic. But then when there was a relaxation of these COVID-19 COVID, uh, 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 precautions, like opening up of the offices, markets, public transport gradually. And then, you know, we could see large public gatherings, both you could see the, those religious uh, uh, gathering in the Kumbh Mela, and also we had a lot of political uh, gatherings. We had so many, three, four, we have elections in three, four states. So all these, you know, things uh, provided a lot of opportunity for the infection to spread from one person to another. Then there was also laxity among the public, you know, feeling that the pa pandemic has ended. A large gathering without masks between January to March was seen, and this facilitated the, this, the rapid spread of infection. And to top up this, there was probably the, the most important thing in this was the arrival of a mutant strain of uh, COVID-19, which is the Delta variant of the uh, strain. So, when we talk about mutation in viruses, we know that RNA viruses have a natural tendency to mutate spontaneously. And whenever they mutate, they mutate in the form of shifts in their genetic material or drifts uh, in there. So, so there can be a, a minor uh, drift or a major shift. So on the basis of that, there is a change in the characteristics of the virus. The two important characteristics of the virus is their ability to infect and transmit infection 
from one person to another person. And second is uh, the virulence. Virulence is how lethal they become, how uh, severe the disease they are going to cause in a particular individual. And it was seen that this uh, Delta variant is 50% more transmissible. That means uh, given the opportunity, uh, then this, this will transmit 50 times, 50% 50 more than its previous uh, 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 variants like alpha, the, the, the wild strain alpha variants. So what happens that uh, during this period, you know, when there was a large congregation, laxity among the public and the emergence of this Delta variant, this resulted into a rapid spread of uh, this virus. And then the vaccination has just begun. You know, uh, at that time, March, April, uh, during this time, uh, it was mainly uh, confined to healthcare workers and probably subsequently then to uh, uh, individual who have high risk condition. So this was a, a very vulnerable situation and uh, uh, that uh, really actually led to rapid increase in the number of cases uh, in the population. And that's, that's the reason we saw this uh, rapid rise. And then the another characteristic thing which you see is that, that, that not only there was a rapid rise in the number of cases, but it was followed by a rapid decline. In, in just a period of one and a half months, what could be the reason for this rapid decline? There could be a number of factors. One, the when the disease spread very rapidly, it infected large proportion of susceptible people in the community. And uh, uh, within four, three to four weeks, they developed uh, 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 antibodies and immunity. The, the vaccination process was also going on during this period, although uh, it is not, I won't say it was very significant because even now uh, it's only 25 to 30 percent of the population which has received one dose of vaccine and about uh, uh, about five to ten percent of the population has two doses. So uh, the other uh, factors here uh, uh, could be the uh, uh, the uh, part for uh, this uh, rapid uh, decline uh, which we have seen is the strict lockdown which was imposed during this period. So, so all three strict lockdown, rapid uh, spread of the infection uh, that all uh, you know resulted and uh, and there was increased mortality not because this virus was more virulent but because the number of cases rose so rapidly that it overwhelmed our healthcare system. And a lot of people actually died of this disease because of lack of uh, adequate and proper medical care for this thing. So now, uh, what can be the likely causes of third? Because third wave is yet to come. It is still in speculation. There are some people who believe that it is a destiny that we are going to get into third wave because this is what actually happened a century ago. Even in uh, uh, Spanish flu, it came into various waves. First wave, second wave was quite uh, intense even uh, uh, during that period. And then um, uh, it came as a third wave. So now what will be the nature of the third wave, if at all it is going to come, will depend upon the release of current lockdown uh, condition. Because you know now the lockdown is being gradually relaxed. and the relaxation of this will again provide our, uh, uh, you know, fresh opportunities for transmission. So that would be the uh, uh, one factor, you know, that if the relaxation is too much, that again, we start having large uh, congregation, both religious, political, or otherwise, and this thing, and people uh, uh, do not uh, suppose uh, 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 follow the COVID appropriate behavior then again, the opportunity will increase. But at the same time, now we also have to know the presence of uh, susceptible individual in the population. Because in the second wave, it is believed from various, uh, again, uh, epidemiological uh, surveys that about 70% of the population has been affected by, uh, 
uh, with COVID-19 after the second wave. So it will again depend upon how big is this pool of susceptible individual in the population. Then the vaccine coverage by that time, so in another one month time, what percentage of the population uh, would have uh, received vaccine. And then waning immunity. It has been seen that even if you give vaccine to people or those who have developed natural infection, the immunity starts waning. And recently there are some uh, newspaper reports you know, from uh, different countries that uh, the antibodies have started waning within a period of six weeks to, to three months. So if that is so, all those people who have suffered from COVID-19 in the first wave, and maybe some of them in the second wave would have probably lost their significant uh, immunity uh, by the time the third wave comes. So, so they, these pool, you know, these people so-called previously vaccinated or previously uh, infected by natural infection uh, may become fresh cases again because their immunity has waned to a level where it is no more uh, conferring immunity against this disease. Then this, another factor which will be very important is the emergence of new variant, which is again more transmissible than the Delta variant we have. And the, the, and the mutation uh, with the new variant, which has the capability of escaping immunity to previously circulating strain. So that's why, you know, it's, it's very difficult to predict that whether we are going to have the third wave. And if we have that third wave, what will be the nature of that third wave? Because it would depend on all these factors. Some of these factors are within our controls. Other factors like mutation of the virus is not within our control. So different people have tried to project the nature of the uh, third wave in, in these different colored waves. You know, this thing. The first uh, which is appear to be the, the the first scenario, which is most likely scenario for smaller third wave, which is shown in the uh, green um, uh, waveform. This is only you know if the restrictions are lifted, because if you if the COVID nineteen lockdown restrictions are lifted, then there is more opportunity for the virus to get transmitted from one person to other person. So this is the likely you know which is going to be smaller than the second. The second is what is called the purple uh, scenario. This is the scenario here. If the virus mutates to into more, uh, uh, you know, uh, mutates to a more uh, virulent form or more uh, transmissive, more infective form, then the, this wave can be even bigger than the second wave. And the third one is the blue wave, which means if the strict lockdown is imposed the moment there is a trend towards increase in the number of cases, then we can significantly mitigate the, the uh, severity of, of the wave, which you would see without lockdown of this thing. Now, the important thing in this is that these three scenarios do not uh, take into consideration the effect of vaccination, which may further mitigate the third wave, because this is what you can see from the UK. Here, UK uh, experience, what you are seeing here is that this is the first wave of the UK, then this is the second wave, and now this is the third wave, what you are seeing here. So what is important uh, lesson, you know, which we are uh, learning from this UK, it is not only a warning, but also a hope for vaccinated world. What is this hope for vaccinated world is that uh, with the third wave, as they, they opened up, they lifted all the lockdown restriction, you can see uh, that there is an increase in the number of cases here. But the good thing here is that this is the number of deaths here that despite there is a significant increase in the number of cases, there is no increase in the deaths. Here. So the hospital admissions, the deaths, and those uh, uh, patients uh, uh, going uh, 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 presenting with serious form of illness is much less. So this is the protection which has been provided by the vaccines. So if, if, if you uh, if we could vaccinate a large percentage of our patients, because in UK, they have been able to uh, vaccinate 70% of their population by July 2021, because 
they started vaccinating quite early uh, uh, probably in december 2020 and from that time 70% of their population has received two doses of the vaccine and you can see the impact of those two doses of vaccine is that though the number of cases have increased but uh, the, the the deaths and the serious form of illness are not there so 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 even if there is a wave third wave then if if the vaccination uh, uh, is adequate in the population then uh, it, it can be a good thing but we know that uh, at present in india uh, the uh, only only about uh, 7% of the people have got two doses about 25 to 30% have got only one dose and the, the third wave which is being projected by uh, you know one of the uh, very authentic organization the tata institute of fundamental research according to them uh, the the number of cases will start rising in august and probably it would reach in their peak in october and then gradually it will come down and by december probably most of the, the cases would end so that's that what their projections are but then as i said there are so many other ifs and buts here you know uh, which can you know impact uh, the overall uh, picture which we are going to see uh, in this in the in the in the uh, in this situation so uh, so now we'll talk about coronavirus mutants and what are the variants of concern you know, you know uh, variants of interest variants of concerns uh, and uh, we we know as i mentioned to you that uh, covid-19 is an rna virus and they have a natural tendency to mutate and more the virus spreads and replicates the greater the chance for mutation to occur so one, one thing here i would like to mention that if you provide lot of hindrance for the virus to transmit that can be in the form of lockdowns that can be in the form of following covid appropriate behavior that we use of mask keeping a safe distance or with the vaccination if you put lot of obstruction to the spread or transmission of this virus from one person to another this virus will tend to mutate so that it becomes more infective and when it becomes more infective usually in the process it loses its virulence so it become less virulent and and causes less severe form of disease but if the virus has a free transmission that means the people are not following those uh, 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 measures which prevent the uh, transmission of virus from one person to another person then uh, this this replication continues the mutation continues and virus is not at a compulsion to mutate uh, or to to lose its uh, pathogenicity to lose its virulence for this thing. so there are many mutations which occur which are not of much interest because they don't affect either the the infectivity of the virus or the virulence of the virus but some mutation may result in what we call variants of concerns which make the virus transmit more easily or escape immunity developed against unmutated virus by natural infection or by vaccination so this thing so uh, you you must be aware of this indian uh, sars cov2 genomic consortium what is called insacog now this has been uh, established uh, by ministry of health and family welfare and the De uh, department of biotechnology via their official memorandum on 18th january and this include about 10 national laboratories here which are you know authorized to do a, a regular surveillance of uh, 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 the emergence of new mutants in indian patients you know so this is what it has been going on now since then and uh, 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 this this uh, uh, insacog you know was the one who picked up this uh, delta variant uh, somewhere in march this thing and this process is going on because as i mentioned to you that what will be the uh, nature of the third wave Uh, would also depend upon the viral mutation and if these mutations are picked up early and then 
if they are related to the epidemiological data in terms of uh, a surge in number of cases and the appearance of some new uh, uh, mutants then this this can be correlated and then necessary measures uh, need to be taken uh, to uh, uh, to stop or to prevent or to mitigate the spread of the uh, virus uh, with this new new mutants this thing so in so in ka so they here it is uh, 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 they had discovered this b1617 which is the delta variant as i mentioned to you it was discovered uh, on 12th march 2021 which was then later on labeled as delta variant and declared variant of concern by who on may 2021 so the, the this virus has been uh, you know given names uh, differently as you can see here these are the scientific names but uh, who give them according to the alphabets of latin language here so you you can see this alpha beta gamma and delta this is according to the you know the sequence in which over the timeline different uh, mutants have been identified the first one alpha which was identified in uk then beta in south africa gamma in brazil and then you know in march the delta variant uh, which was uh, uh, identified in india so these are the four Uh, variants of uh, concerns which have been identified and what we have seen in all of these four is that uh, uh, these two particularly the beta variants and the delta variants are associated with a significant increase in the infectivity so there is a high transmission and the good thing is that vaccines which we have got uh, at present the covishield and uh, the covaxin uh, they still have Uh, uh, they are effective uh, against these mutants, but the magnitude of protection is is lower in the sense that uh, it 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 may not uh, uh, prevent the person from developing an infection, and uh, uh, which uh, can be transmitted to other people, but it can definitely uh, prevent the development of uh, more serious um, forms of disease, as we see in the. as we saw in the uk and we are continuously seeing in united kingdom where large number of people have been vaccinated and you can see that even though the number of cases are rising and these are covid positive patient but they most of them have a mild disease and the the number of uh, patients requiring hospitalization and those who have died are negligible so the next question is what lies ahead how can we prevent the third wave and then we'll talk about the covid-19 vaccination the challenges and solution and then finally to safely reopening the businesses for this thing so how can we protect ourselves and our community from covid-19 we have three you know tools i would say the first very important tool the major tool the most powerful epidemiological tool is the covid appropriate behavior that should continue that means wearing mask keeping physical distance and using hand hygiene should be continued till we actually uh, vaccinate our uh, uh, population uh, to a level uh, which uh, provides uh, herd immunity so uh, so that's uh, that's so till that time you know the infection transmission continues uh, this this uh, uh, these measures need to be continued the second is the vaccination drive should be upgraded at a quick but a sustainable pace you know so all the eligible person should be encouraged to accept vaccination and then besides this until we achieve these things you know these goals you know and if suppose there is a localized spread of infection then we must provide limited lockdown or curbs at hot spots of infection with the gradual reopening so the idea is basically to protect the healthcare system from getting overwhelmed so that so we can we can actually confine this uh, local spread to that area and uh, uh, that that uh, that's the the things which we have to do and uh, the 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 use of this uh, covid appropriate behavior is a very important thing which we can actually see from the study you know this is a data from 1918 pandemic you know this is the spanish flu Uh, in america and which which suggested you know that those places where 
these COVID appropriate, uh, this behavior was uh, was strictly followed, you know, there's a social distancing, mask, and all those things, you know, this is in blue dots, you know, as you can see. So these are the areas in United States, not only had low mortality, you know, this 200, 300, 400, then these red areas where these uh, uh, policies were not followed, you know, this thing. And not only there was a decreased mortality, but there was a significant increase in the manufacturing and employment uh, uh, policies. So that shows that social distancing and masks are still the cornerstone of pandemic response, and they can even enable better economic recovery if we continue to follow that till uh, you know we go to the next step where we can um, vaccinate uh, our majority of our population. So social distancing and physical distancing, social distancing means avoiding large gatherings. Physical distancing means maintaining a distance of at least six feet from other whenever possible. And this six feet distance is because whenever a person coughs, he generates a kind of aerosol and it, the, that aerosol contains what is called droplets. And these droplets do not go beyond a distance of six feet. So they are heavy and they settle down to the ground or to the surfaces uh, within the six feet uh, distance. So, so, uh, so that's, that's why you, know, you have to maintain uh, this much distance and both are essential. You know, the social distancing and, and uh, the, the physical distancing, both are important to do that. The face masks are very, very important. And it is very important to know that how they should be worn. And you know that it should be snug, but comfortable against the sides of the face. It should cover mouth, nose, and chin. Because you see, majority of the people are just putting their mask for the sake of putting the mask. And uh, 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 the other important thing is that when they when they speak, most of the people they tend to remove their mask from the mouth because they feel that probably they feel restricted in speaking when the mask is on, and and that actually results into uh, the spread of infection. So so the mask is, uh, is removed at a time when it is most needed. So when people speak, they should ensure that their mask is on, on the nose and uh, uh, on, on the face. Uh, it needs to be secured with ties or ear loops. It should be non, there, there should not be any valve. Uh, uh, this thing, it should be made of multiple layers and allow you to breathe without restriction. So if, suppose you feel, you know, suffocated or you feel there is a problem in breathing, then probably uh, that may not be the right mask to use. And, uh, it uh, should be able to withstand machine washing and drying and uh, without getting uh, damaged or changed in its shape for this thing. Now, COVID-19 vaccine, as I uh, told you, is uh, touted as the most effective public health measure to end the pandemic because it takes time. It is, I think, the first time in the history of mankind that a vaccine has been developed within a year of a pandemic. It has not been, not only the, the genome sequence has been identified, various vaccine platforms have been created, the, the, the bench studies have been conducted, and it has been, you know, followed by uh, 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 different um, uh, stages, level one, level two, level three uh, uh, stages of uh, uh, population-based studies of both safety and, and uh, efficacy have been done and uh, these vaccines are now available and majority of these vaccines are doing fairly well uh, this thing so this vaccine i would say has led to widespread optimism about the beginning of the end of covid-19 pandemic so how do these vaccines work there are as i mentioned to you there are different uh, platforms there are uh, rna vaccines then there are vector vaccines you know then you have killed vaccines. So there are different vaccines are there and ultimately uh, they uh, provide antibodies. They also stimulate cell mediated uh, uh, immunity and uh, they, 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 they prevent infection. In fact, most of the vaccines which we have so far, they do not uh, uh, prevent infection. So people do get uh, uh, infection with COVID-19 and they are capable of transmitting this infection to others. 
the major role which the vaccine is playing at the moment is preventing disease preventing intensive care unit admission and then preventing deaths preventing hospital admission so these are the basic you know the, the most important things uh, which uh, we are able to achieve uh, these these uh, vaccines for these things so uh, to the ideally it would should prevent infection prevent illness prevent severe illness and death and prevent transmission so this thing so the the present day vaccines are preventing uh, illness and preventing severe illness and death the two vaccines which are available in india at the moment of course the third one has also come the covid shield which is a, uh, a viral vector vaccine and the other which is a co vaccine which is inactivated or killed vaccine uh, which has been uh, totally indigenous vaccine prepared in india by bharat biotech and uh, the covid shield has been also uh, developed in india by serum institute in collaboration with astrazeneca <coughs> recently uh, in april sputnik which is a russian vaccine has also been given emergency use um, uh, uh, on the basis of the emergency use they have been uh, given a go ahead uh, uh, in the indian population now if you look into the, the efficacy uh, is uh, you can see this that these messenger rna vaccines have 95% uh, efficacy this these two both of them require two doses at a period of 3 to 4 weeks and then we have this covid shield which uh, which provides 70% uh, efficacy against most uh, strains of the virus and then we have this um, uh, johnson and johnson this is not available and you can see that these vaccines have uh, minimal or minor side effects in the form of fatigue headache chills muscle pain especially after the second do dose and similarly the covid shield here you can see the the injection site pain is a, a very important symptom and the other are the fever muscle aches and headaches you know they which last for a few days and uh, recently uh, the results of phase 3 trial of co vaccine which is a indian uh, um, uh, vaccine you know this is probably one of the largest uh, safety trial involving 25800 Uh, participants and uh, you can see uh, that uh, this vaccine again has a similar efficacy as uh, uh, the astrazeneca covid shield so this is 78% efficacy against mild moderate and severe covid 19 in fact uh, uh, in today's newspaper uh, probably uh, this is 60% 61% uh, uh, efficacious against uh, the delta uh, variant of covid-19 65% efficacy against delta variant 93% efficacy against severe covid-19 disease reducing hospitalization and 63% efficacy against asymptomatic transmission so this uh, vaccine when it was initially introduced there was lot of speculation and probably people thought that uh, uh, certain um, the, this vaccine has not undergone the the safety and efficacy trial in indian population but i think uh, these results uh, uh, are uh, good enough uh, to show uh, the merits of this vaccine to be given to large number of people in our country now where we are in terms of vaccination is concerned you know about about 35 crore people have received at least one dose of uh, covid-19 and at present uh, the, the about 7% of the indian population 7.2% have been fully vaccinated with two doses and about 25 to 8 25.8% have received at least one dose so that clearly shows you know that uh, we are far away from the vaccination goal of 70 to 80% with two doses and that's why you know if the if the third wave is going to come that is in the next 2 3 months then uh, the role of uh, covid appropriate behavior um, uh, and other uh, um, restricted lockdown measures is going to be a very big you know in containing the um, uh, or mitigating the severity of third wave so this is 
it is a very very important thing to to understand and uh, this is one thing which uh, was the issue was raised that uh, whether these vaccines work against this uh, delta strain which is highly infectious but it has been seen now that with all the uh, existing vaccines uh, uh, though the efficacy is less but it is preventing uh, uh, the development of serious form of uh, uh, covid-19 disease which is uh, significantly decreasing the hospitalization and death and as can be seen from the uh, data from public health in england and also uh, 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 we have seen that uh, though the number of cases in england are rising but uh, hospitalizations are are very very low for this thing so, so this is uh, our co vaccine uh, this has been also uh, been found to be effective in neutralizing the double mutant strain uh, of covid-19 or the delta plus for this thing so uh, there is also been a talk that uh, as the virus is mutating can we also change our vaccine can we tweak the vaccine genetic material so that they become more uh, effective against the uh, uh, new new uh, uh, strains of the virus and i think uh, this is something which is very common and uh, we have been doing it for uh, influenza vaccine uh, uh, for last many years we know that every year we have a new influenza vaccine and uh, uh, we have this uh, uh, national institute of virology pune and other laboratories in the country which do the regular uh, surveillance of uh, uh, influenza virus and whenever they look for the, or find any shifts or drifts in the virus genetic material the, the vaccines are accordingly tweaked and then a new vaccine is uh, uh, generated so i think uh, this is all also possible uh, when uh, as the virus mutation occurs you will find that uh, newer vaccines will be developed and uh, the people may have to take booster doses to cover up for this thing the another important thing regarding vaccine has been the uh, the hesitancy there are many people who are not willing to take uh, uh, vaccine um, and the main reason uh, for not taking vaccine is probably uh, there are concerns Uh, about vaccine side effects and safety and probably lack of trust in the process because uh, because the way it has been done uh, very quickly as against the the, pre the previous vaccine uh, developments uh, there are many people who who raised uh, uh, many doubts about this and then recently there was a, a global survey uh, which was done in uh, for 19 countries and uh, you can see here that uh, the degree of hesitancy varies from uh, lowest of 54% in russia to about 88 to 90% uh, in china in in india as you can see here uh, there is a again um, about 74% or 75% of the people uh, would say that uh, that they will take vaccine provided it is proven safe and effective and in this they want that it is the government sources you know if they provide this kind of authentic information regarding rather than the the misinformation which is being uh, circulated into the social media so i think this is very very important that we must address this vaccine hesitancy hesitancy issues and the different way we we need to tackle is uh, that the healthcare provider should give direct recommendation for vaccination identify patients concerned educating patients on vaccine risks and benefits and finally dispelling misconceptions about the disease and the vaccines for this thing so last point which i am going to discuss are the what are the goals of a safe workplace during the covid 19 pandemic for this thing uh, when we are reopening uh, uh, in the near future we have to make sure that the facility is fully clean disinfected and uh, equipment with a blueprint for maintaining safe condition second there is a need to set up support system for employees who return to work and adjust to new realities and emotional challenges pre presented by the pandemic and finally creating a plan for safe work environment that protects employees and the customer alike from risks connected to covid-19 including exposure and transmission so we have to use 
multiple methods you know in the workplace because each one method may not be 100% uh, effective the uh, no mask can be 100% effective even maintaining six feet distance may not be always possible so you should have multiple layers of protection you know in the workplace so that the transmission of infection uh, is minimized to the lowest level then general recommendation which we have already mentioned is uh, you know the covid appropriate behaviors wearing a face mask covering the mouth and the nose and then the practice of social and physical distancing you know so these are the things which needs to be followed particularly when we are going to open schools and colleges uh, in the near future uh, these uh, uh, things need to be followed the people should be encouraged to be vaccinated as soon as it is possible as soon as it is available and uh, there, there should be adequate facility to wash hands to clean and there is a, should be a regular cleaning and disinfection of uh, 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 frequently touched surfaces such as phones keyboards door knobs handles and faucets and this thing and then uh, some recommendation regarding uh, uh, staying at home when somebody is sick avoid uh, going to or uh, meeting uh, elderly people who are at a high risk of uh, developing serious form of illness even though they have been vaccinated uh, as we still do not know for how long the the impact of this vaccination would last for how long the the protective antibody levels will be there so uh, till the disease is over till, till the pandemic is over one should avoid uh, meeting uh, uh, um, the high risk individual and then of course uh, maintaining healthy habits like getting enough sleep eating healthy foods dr uh, drinking plenty of water and exercise uh, so all these things you know keep our immune system well functioning for this thing regular uh, screening of employee employees for the presence of any fever any cough sputum looking for signs uh, you know uh, of the disease and then again at workplace maintaining uh, a distance of at least 6 feet for this thing. so also so what to do you know when an employee develops symptoms this thing so i think the first thing would be to immediately separate the employees or the employee who is ill from the other workers customers and visitors send the employee home and instruct them to follow with the healthcare provider for appropriate testing and treatment close off all areas that the ill employee was using until they can be properly disinfected and clean and unvaccinated individual who have come in close contact of this person who was sick must be quarantined immediately after being identified and identified and tested at least 5 to 7 days after that because that's the usual incubation period Uh, 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 this thing for um, uh, 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 development of any symptoms or uh, uh, disease. Fully vaccinated individual who meet uh, the following criteria usually are not required to quarantine. Employee well-being and resilience. You know there are many stressors uh, which are uh, associated with COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which include fear. and worry about your own health and the health of your loved ones changes in the sleeping habits eating habits difficulty sleeping concentrating worsening of chronic health worsening of chronic mental health and increase uh, substance use you know increase use of alcohol tobacco tea drugs you know all these things you know which are associated with this thing so well being and the resilience at the work these are very very important things you know and uh, 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 the, uh, there is a need, to, uh, as I mentioned to you, to get uh, enough sleep because sleep is a natural immune booster. So if we take adequate sleep, uh, our immunity uh, uh, remains very good. Our immune system works very well. Uh, you develop, you mount a very good response to vaccines also. Regular exercise and uh, maintaining healthy diet. So I think all these things are very very important things. so to conclude covid-19 pandemic reaches on globally a third wave of infection seems inevitable as per 
many experts and may be triggered by um, new viral strains and relaxation of lockdowns. The third wave can be mitigated with the help of social distancing, mask, and vaccine use to restart work in the new normal workplaces will have to adapt themselves to create a safe working environment. Thank you very much for your kind att attention and I'll be very happy to take uh, uh, some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Suri uh, I had a lot of questions uh, in my mind, but uh, I, I don't find any topic which you have uh, left unattended. You have covered all the dimensions. Everything, the Delta variant, the vaccination, the global scenario, and what are the measures we should take and how to prevent the next uh, pandemic wave, many, many things. So it was excellent talk, but uh, we have a few questions by uh, our uh, audience. First of all, I will request uh, Dr. S.K. Chaudhary. He is our Deputy Director General at uh, our division ICR who looks after the entire country for the natural resource management. Dr. Chaudhary, sir, can you just uh, put your question? Dr. S.K. Chaudhary? Uh, Arpit, can you put on uh, Dr. Chaudhary? Unmute. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the, uh, yes, I'm doing it. Doing it. In the meantime, uh, we have uh, some other questions. Uh, one question uh, is Dr. Zab, uh, by uh, Dr. Uh, Gupal Raz. Uh, after taking two, two, uh, two doses, uh, doses of vaccination, is it advisable to take booster dose? If anybody wants to take, will it work better to develop uh, more antibodies? It's, this is a, a topic of uh, debate at the moment uh, because uh, we, we, we don't have... Uh, adequate data on the longevity of immunity, which we develop after two doses. Although I think even today's newspaper, uh, it was mentioned that uh, in many cases, the antibody titles have started falling six weeks after the second dose. But at the moment, I think there is a talk about giving a booster dose in people who have, uh, uh, you know, who are, having immunocompromised state. You know, those who have, uh, who have difficulty in uh, mounting uh, immune response to the vaccine. So people with cancers, people on steroids, uh, people on chemotherapies. So there, are, there is a group of people which are called immunocompromised individuals. These are the people who uh, uh, mount a very low response to uh, uh, two doses of vaccine. And if uh, you measure their antibody titer, and if it is low, then the I think uh, the, there is a lot of consideration regarding giving the booster dose. Although there is no uh, policy yet, I think uh, it is in the, in the, in, in the process of, uh, I would say, a lot of debate at the moment. And soon, uh, I think uh, there will be some directive from the government whether there is a need for a booster dose and maybe it would start probably in uh, high risk individuals first. Thank you. Not uh, high risk, but uh, immunocompromised individuals. Uh, Dr. Nirja, you have any question to ask? Uh, yes, sir. She is our, uh, our vice chancellor uh, at Horticulture University in uh, Telangana. Mm -hmm. Namaste, sir. Very nice to listen to today's topic, uh, which is uh, actually important in nowadays COVID-19 situation. And uh, my question is uh, actually whether we can take two different kind of doses. The recording has stopped. This meeting is being recorded. Two different kind of vaccinations, sir. 
Yeah, there has been a few studies recently which have been published where, uh, uh, you know, uh, different combinations have been tried. That means uh, there is one group which have received two doses of Pfizer vaccine, the another group which have received two doses of Covishield, and the third group which have received first dose of Covishield followed by second dose by Pfizer vaccine. And uh, it has been found that uh, the antibody titers which were developed, they were maximum with two doses of Pfizer followed by Covishield and with Pfizer. And, and then the last one was the two doses of Covishield. So there are some, I think, re initial reports where uh, when you are using uh, two different vaccines you know, uh, for immunization, first, uh, the, say, Covishield followed by uh, Pfizer vaccine, this results in a much better uh, immune response than having the two doses of Covishield. So, so there are now the reports and uh, 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 the various uh, studies are there, but uh, there is no policy as yet. Okay, so thank you for related information, sir. Uh, Agrawal, sir, thank you very much for conducting a nice seminar, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, now we have a question by uh, Suresh Sandraji. Uh, can you uh, ask uh, your question? Yes. Are you listening? Um, yes. Yeah. So my question is... Uh, if I'm uh, vaccinated with uh, two doses and I want to just have a morning walk without mask, uh, keeping uh, that safe distance of uh, six feet or eight feet, so is it uh, advisable or uh, what should I do? Actually, I want to have oxygen uh, in the morning walk too. So I want to just avoid uh, this face mask. That is the point. Yeah, but, but uh, here I would like to say that there is no evidence to show that if you are using mask, you will get less oxygen. Though you may find it uh, difficult to breathe sometimes because of the resistance of the mask. Uh, so that depends on the type of mask you are using or the number of masks you are using. There are, there, there are situations where people are using two masks. But uh, I, uh, I, I, I don't think that uh, you will get less oxygen. But as far as the safety is concerned, suppose you have received two doses of uh, vaccine and uh, uh, you want to go to a public place without mask, then you are not very sure about people around you. If you are in a place, like suppose you are in an office and all the office staff has been vaccinated. Because we know that now many uh, you know organizations are getting their employees vaccinated uh, and then, so we, if suppose you are sitting in a room or in an office where all employees are vaccinated and they are healthy and there are nobody is having any symptom, then uh, you you even if you sit without mask, uh, there is much less risk. But in a in a open place, uh, if 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 uh, you are not coming in very close contact with any person, as you just mentioned that you are maintaining a more than six feet distance. The risk should be quite low. Now, but the question is, when you are saying this, you are talking about risk to you or risk to others for this thing, you know, because you are vaccinated, you are protected, you know. So, and, uh, but you can still carry infection because vaccine will not prevent you from developing infection. And with that infection, you may carry virus and, transmit to others. You may not develop serious form of disease. So that's the thing, you know, you must know the limitation of the vaccine. because And these vaccines are not 100% effective. Some are 70% effective, some are 60 But they are more than 90% effective in preventing serious form of disease. That is there. But then you can still get infected. You can still carry the uh, uh, infection which can be transmitted to others. So, so, so that way, uh, you know, uh, these things have to be kept in mind uh, when uh, you know you are uh, you are going to public places. So you have to see the risk of you getting infection, risk of you giving infection. What are the uh, 
the chances of you coming in contact with people of unknown uh, uh, vaccination status so all these things are there you know so uh, so whatever risk you are thinking you know or reason you are thinking that has to be taken in that thank you thank you doctor thank you Mr. Agarwal, you are muted. Yeah, now we have Dr. Chaudhary with us. Yeah, but what Sir. I did, uh, I am online with uh, my mobile now because okay. uh, there is there is some problem. Are you able to listen to me, Doctor? Yes, uh, yes, doctor. yes. Uh, yes. Sir, sir, sorry to disturb you. If you are uh, logged in with mobile, so can you please switch off uh, Zoom from your laptop because it is creating disturbance. Echo, echo. Okay. Yeah. Just I'm I'm leaving meeting from there now. It is all right. Yes. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Yes, Doctor Chaudhary. Uh, sorry, because of some system problem, I was not able to unmute myself. Anyway, uh, thank you very much, Doctor Suri. It was a wonderful lecture. We enjoyed fully. My colleagues also they enjoyed this fully. Uh, my simple question: I want to talk in Hindi. If someone gets infected with infect COVID, after infection, उसको दोनों वैक्सीन भी लग गई हो उसके बावजूद भी उसको इन्फेक्शन का पुनः इन्फेक्शन का कितना खतरा है ये ये बहुत ही एक इम्पॉर्टेंट विषय है इसके ऊपर अभी काफी इंफॉर्मेशन गैदर की जा रही है हम इसको वी आर ट्राइंग टू गेट इंफॉर्मेशन बिकॉज जो पीरियड है यहाँ पर जैसे अगर आप देखेंगे वैक्सीन मार्च में स्टार्ट हुआ और ये अभी आ, बात है तो अब कुछ इंफॉर्मेशन आ रही है जिससे ये लग रहा है कि नेचुरल इन्फेक्शन के बाद भी जो हम इम्यूनिटी एक्वायर करते हैं वो छह हफ्ते और तीन महीने के बीच काफी कम हो जाती है और वैक्सीनेशन भी देखा गया है कि जो वैक्सीनेशन के बाद भी जो एंटीबॉडीज डेवलप होते हैं वो भी तीन महीने के बाद उसका लेवल भी काफी कम हो रहा है तो इसका मतलब ये है कि जैसे आपने सवाल किया जिन लोगों को फर्स्ट वेव में इन्फेक्शन हुआ वो अब एक किस्म के एक तरीके से वो एक फ्रेश केसेज है क्योंकि जो इम्यूनिटी उन्होंने शायद उस वक्त डेवलप की वो लगभग वो खत्म हो चुकी है एंड दे आर नाउ यू नो दे आर प्रोन टू डेवलप ए न्यू इन्फेक्शन तो ये uh, जो इसकी जो ड्यूरेशन है वैक्सीनेशन का वो जो सब्जेक्ट uh, है वो काफी क्लोजली वॉच किया वॉच किया जा रहा है और जैसे जैसे और इंफॉर्मेशन आती जाएगी हमारे पास तो फिर लॉन्ग टर्म इम्यूनिटी जब तक ये वायरस खत्म नहीं होता उसको मेंटेन करने के लिए कोई बूस्टर डोज देना पड़ेगा और वो बूस्टर डोज कब देना पड़ेगा कितने टाइम के बाद वो वो इंफॉर्मेशन क्लियर हो जाएगी अभी आज की डेट में तो यही है कि अभी तो हमें पहली फर्स्ट वैक्सीनेशन जो प्रोसीजर है कंप्लीट करना है दो डोज का हमारी पॉपुलेशन का जो कि अभी मुश्किल से हम सात आठ लोगों को दो डोज दे पाए और 25 से 30 परसेंट प्रतिशत लोग वो सिर्फ एक ही डोज मिली है तो अभी तो पहला हमारा जो पहले चरण का जो काम है कि सारी पॉपुलेशन को एक बार मतलब दो जो वैक्सीनेशन के दो डोजेस कंप्लीट करने उसके बाद ये देखना होगा कि तब तक अगर रिस्क अभी भी है वायरस इज स्टिल देयर तो फिर हमें फर्दर प्रोटेक्शन के लिए आगे वैक्सीनेशन करना है बूस्टर डोज देना है अगर वो बूस्टर डोज है वो अगर तब तक कोई न्यू म्यूटेंट्स भी आ गए हैं तो वो वैक्सीन भी ट्विक करके उसके हिसाब से नई वैक्सीन दी जाएगी अभी तक देखिए जैसे फ्लू का एग्जांपल मैं आपको दूं तो तो फ्लू में क्या है कि आप हर साल वैक्सीन देते हैं और क्योंकि फ्लू सीजन है फ्लू सीजन जनरली सर्दियों में होता है और वो तीन चार महीने होता है नवम्बर से लेकर फेबर तक एक फ्लू सीजन चलता है तो इसलिए क्या होता है कि सेप्टेम्बर अक्टूबर में फ्लू की वैक्सीन लगा देते हैं और वो फिर उसके बाद एक साल चलता है 
लेकिन ऐसा देखा गया है कि फ्लू वैक्सीन का भी जो एंटीबॉडी टाइटर और असर है वो तीन से छह महीने का ही है ज्यादा नहीं है तो अब जैसे इंडिया है इंडिया में फ्लू की दो पीक्स आती है एक सितंबर में आती है और एक वही जनवरी फरवरी में आती है तो वो इश्यू है कि अगर हम अगर हमें वैक्सीन देना है और अगर सपोज उस वैक्सीन का असर तीन से छह महीने का है तो हम सेप्टेम्बर पीक को कवर करें या हम फेब्रवरी को करें तो वट इज द राइट टाइम टू गिव फ्लू वैक्सीन तो अभी ये देखा गया है कि जो हमारी सितंबर की पीक है वो सर्दियों की पीक से बड़ी है तो हम उसको अप्रैल में देते हैं बट क्या वो अप्रैल में दी गई फ्लू की वैक्सीन क्या हमें जनवरी फरवरी में जो दूसरी पीक आती है उससे प्रोटेक्ट करती है नहीं करती अगेन हमारे पास उसका भी बहुत क्लियर कट इंफॉर्मेशन नहीं है क्योंकि जो वेस्टर्न कंट्रीज है यूएस है वहां सिंगल पीक आती है विंटर पीक इंडिया में दो पीक आती है ये एक ये सितंबर का और ये तो इसलिए ये एक बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट विषय है इसका आई थिंक जब तक हमारे पास क्लियर कट इंफॉर्मेशन नहीं होगा कि ये वैक्सीन से कितना एंटीबॉडीज बनता है और वो कब तक इफेक्टिव लेवल तक रहती है वो तीन महीने तक रहती है या उससे ज्यादा रहती है वो तब तक उसका प्रोटेक्शन रहेगा उसके बाद फिर हम सोचते हैं लेकिन अभी तो ये है कि हम जो अगर तब तक अगर पैंडेमिक खत्म हो जाता है तो फिर वो इश्यूज जब वो फिर आएंगे कि हमें इसको एनुअल वैक्सीन देना है कि नहीं देना क्या वो एक नॉर्मल अब एक जैसे फ्लू वैक्स फ्लू का इन्फेक्शन होता है तो क्या कोविड भी फ्लू की तरह एक रेगुलर इन्फेक्शन बन जाएगा तो तब वैक्सीन कब देनी है कितनी बार देनी है वो सारे विषय आई थिंक ये बहुत ही कंटेंशियस इशूज है इसके बारे में हमारे पास जैसे जैसे इन्फॉर्मेशन आएगी थैंक यू डॉक्टर साहब थैंक यू डॉक्टर साहब एक एक रिलेटेड और छोटा सा सवाल है जो मेरे और साथियों की भी क्वेरी इस तरह की होगी और उनको भी इस बात को जानने की जिज्ञासा होगी कि हम यूं ही खुश हो रहे हैं कि एक किसी को कोरोना हो गया हम कहते हैं कि हमारे अंदर बहुत एंटीबॉडीज बन गई थी और बड़े आराम से हम घूम सकते हैं ये भ्रांति है या क्या ये कैसे मिथ्या है या कैसे आप इसको एनालाइज करते हैं आप इसको शॉर्ट टर्म हैप्पीनेस बोल सकते हैं तो वही भ्रांति वाली बात ही है क्योंकि ऐसा देखा गया है कि जिन लोगों को पिछले साल इन्फेक्शन हुआ था तो ऐसे कई लोगों को इस साल भी हुआ क्योंकि उनकी जो नेचुरल इन्फेक्शन के बाद जो इम्यूनिटी होती है वो बहुत ही फ्रेजाइल है एफेमरल एंड फ्रेजाइल जिसे बोलते हैं ना तो वो जो नेचुरल इन्फेक्शन के बाद जो इम्यूनिटी है वो शॉर्ट लिव है और उसके बाद कब uh, आप दोबारा से वलरेबल हो जाते अगर ऐसा होता तो हम फिर फ्लू की एक ही बारी वैक्सीन देते हम बार बार हर साल फ्लू की वैक्सीन क्यों देते हैं तो इसका मतलब जो पिछले साल जिन लोगों को फ्लू का इन्फेक्शन हुआ इसका मतलब उस इन्फेक्शन से वो लाइफ लॉन्ग प्रोटेक्टेड नहीं है थैंक यू डॉक्टर थैंक यू Uh, she wants to ask some question uh, related to the immunocompromise. Uh, Chavi, can you ask your question? Uh, yes, yes. Hello, doctor. Uh, so you were talking about uh, immunosuppressed patients, right? I wanted to understand whether I can still be considered immunosuppressed or not. I was a case of Wegener's, which is vasculitis, uh, and I stopped my medication in two thousand nineteen. and uh, i recently had a very bad bad case of covid uh, so i'm not sure that got complicated because of the history of immunosuppression or was it my bad luck i had emphysema and my uh, like that puncture in the lung and uh, my my igg antibodies did not come out to be positive even after one or two months of my case and they were barely positive and now they are again negative so wanted to understand how will the vaccine help me or whether i have to always be in the fear of you know uh, getting such a complicated case again i think that is what i try to explain although the information is only preliminary because when you say somebody mm-hmm. is immunocompromised that means they lack in adequate immune response so vaccine when yeah. when we give vaccine to somebody uh, it actually stimulate our immune system to form uh, antibodies both uh, humoral mm-hmm. antibodies as well as cell mediated immunity so there are two types of immune responses we have so these immune responses become 
uh, compromised in certain situations, like people who take steroids. Now, it all depends how much steroid right. for how long and along with steroid, whether other immunosuppressive drugs as athioprine, methotrexate, cyclophosphamide. There are so many things, you know. I took it is, it is a, so there I are took a, a, cyclophosphamide. So it all depends, you know, that uh, what combination of drugs a particular person has received and for how long and what is the impact of that, those drugs on the immune system. So even when you stop these drugs, the, the immunosuppression continues for some time before it recovers gradually. What so, is that so, time typically? So that, that again would vary, you know, dep depending upon the duration of drugs taken, combination of drugs taken. So the best thing would be to, uh, whenever suppose these people get vaccine, after mm -hmm. getting their second dose of vaccine, uh, I, I would say after uh, uh, eight weeks, six to eight weeks or maybe two to three months, their antibody level should be measured. And if the antibody levels are not adequate, very low, then that means immunosuppression has still continued. So because that is a sign that a particular person has not mounted an immune response. So these are the situation, what we should do. The, 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 the information yeah. is not very clear right now, but there is a debate that these patients can be given a booster dose. Now, whether that booster dose after some time will, will lead to significant improvement in, in their uh, uh, antibody levels or will provide them adequate protection, that is yet to be seen. Okay, but we cannot decide on boosters those until and unless this debate is clear, right? Because yes, legally, we are still, not allowed. Yeah, still, you know, we are trying to, you know, gather more information on this. And I'm sure uh, very soon, uh, okay. you will have some uh, kind of government policy or directive on this. And uh, 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 you will know more about it in near future. Is there a test we can do for under, uh, to identify whether we are immunosuppressed or not? I took cyclophosphamide prednisolone, uh, rituximab for over three years, but I stopped it in 2019. See, we, we can do tests, but those tests may not give us uh, uh, a very clear cut information. I think it is okay. the history. History is very important. If there okay. is a history of taking these drugs yeah. and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, if somebody has been taking those drugs till recent past or they are mm -hmm. still taking it, then definitely, uh, uh, the, the immunosuppressed state should be suspected. And okay. these patients, if they get vaccine, uh, it should, they should be followed up. They should be monitored for development of adequate levels of antibodies. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Then I'll be monitoring that. Thank you. Uh, Professor, there are a lot of questions, but we'll, uh, possibly your time, we'll not take uh, many questions. But uh, the last question we can take, uh, the uh, whether the third wave is going to affect the children? See, <laughs> Again, this is a very important question. Uh, if, if suppose there are 60 experts, uh, uh, this uh, is a divided debate. There are about uh, 40 people saying that probably the children are going to uh, be affected in the next wave. The other people uh, do not think. But how I see this uh, uh, issue uh, on the basis of the evidence so far, I would like to put it across. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, many. What is the genesis of this? The first uh, factor which uh, made people think that children are going to be affected in the third wave is because now we are vaccinating adults. So if we have vaccinate adults, then the children become uh, are left. They are the they become vulnerable, and we may get more infection with them. But this has not been found to be true, because now there are countries like even UK, where 70% of vaccination, 70% population has received vaccination. Most of the adults have got both the doses of vaccine. This has not resulted into any increase in the infection rate in children. They continue to be safe, number one. Number two, when we are talking about the natural infection in the community, and if you do the zero surveillance, zero surveys, we have found that the children also having antibodies. More than 50-60% of the children also have the similar amount of antibodies as they are adults. So children also get protected with the natural infection, though we have not given the vaccine. Third thing is that so far in the epidemic, 
we have not seen children developing serious form of disease most of the disease seen in children have been asymptomatic or very mild because we see that in children the as2 receptors which the virus uses to enter into the body, into the cell they are not that well developed in children so that molecule that receptor which makes the virus enter into the cell is not well developed or well formed in children and that probably is one of the reasons it is thought that children are not affected by this so i don't think that children will be affected uh, in the in the next wave one reason maybe there may be more infection mild infection in children because uh, children are not vaccinated but they are only to some extent protected by natural infection or otherwise because we have not seen in the first wave in the second wave when the disease was so severe when the whole families were involved where the elderly got sick admitted in the hospital many of them died the children also simultaneously got infected there were very few cases where children had moderate disease or severe disease most of the children have mild disease so uh, so uh, i i don't think you know that uh, uh, the children are at a special risk and uh, even you know uh, many people are not uh, it, it is a general thinking that we are not going to open schools till the children are vaccinated mm -hmm. but uh, again as, as i say the children are at a least risk of developing serious form of disease children may be as well protected with the natural infection as are the adults even though vaccination is not given to them that should not be a reason for not opening the schools you know the children can uh, safely go to school provided you know we follow the covid appropriate behavior till the the infection in the community you know goes away till we develop herd immunity and this thing so uh, this uh, so far with the evidence available uh, my personal view is that uh, uh, we, I, i i do not think that children will be at a special risk to develop more serious form of disease in the next year thank you thank you very much dr suri it was excellent talk and more uh, educative and uh, i think uh, the the concern which we all had has been uh, responded very well by you uh you have not uh, as i told you in the beginning you have not left any dimension of this uh, talk uh, which you have not attended whether it's a uh, vaccine hesitancy it was a new uh, terminology which we could uh, know the tweaking uh, vaccines and uh, the uh, the complete information about the uh, delta uh, uh, variant and uh, many other variants alpha beta gamma and uh, how uh, in which countries they are originating and how this uh, Uh, RNA viruses are different from uh, the, the other kind of viruses, vector viruses, different kind of vaccines. Everything uh, I think you have covered very well, and whatever was left, you have covered in the responses to the uh, audience, uh, very uh, august audience, uh, which includes our vice chancellors, which includes our directors, deputy director generals, and many more. And there are many uh, uh, persons who have joined through the other platform. So uh, from uh, core of my heart, I will just. I like to thank you dr suri very much for educating all of us and for responding to our queries and for your information we uh, have such lectures every week and uh, we have in the past as i told you very eminent persons and today was one of the very uh, important lecture uh, which is of great concern to each one of us and we have cleared all our doubts so thank you very much and with that uh, we close this lecture thank you sir namaskar namaskar